Hey everybody, welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast, a podcast brought to you by the Springs Church in Jacksonville, Florida. On this episode, we sit down with Pastor John and Krista Bailey, senior pastors of the Springs Church, and they are going to share their ministry journey and the incredible ways God has used them over the course of their life. You can listen to this podcast on all major podcast platforms, or you can watch it on YouTube and Facebook, and be sure to share it out with friends and family. But for right now, sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to Beyond Sunday, episode three. We're so uh, delighted to have you guys joining in with us. And I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has been sharing this podcast out, reviewing it, just sharing it with your friends. It's been a big encouragement. Now, today is probably the podcast that I'm most excited about and the one I've been looking forward to doing um, <laughs> since we began that, this, uh, this podcast. And today... Uh, I have the opportunity to sit down with uh, the founding pastors and the senior pastors of our church, the Springs Church, and talk through a little bit of their testimony, their story, a glean from their wisdom. I think it's going to be a huge blessing to you. Uh, Pastor John and Krista Bailey um, are kind of like spiritual parents to me. Uh, I had the opportunity to connect with them in Ireland, and today they're sitting down with us. So enjoy, sit back, uh, and enjoy the conversation. Pastor John and Krista Welcome to your own podcast in a kind of way. This is, this is really your guys' podcast. No, it's great to be here. And I want to just say before we even get started, uh, thanks to Sheldon, uh, to Brendan and Sheldon and yourself and just the people that really have a vision to do this. Because this, this is a great venue. It's a lot of times at church on Sunday we're standing at a pulpit preaching. This is a place that we can just sit and talk and be real and raw and honest and you know probably not too raw but um <laughs> anyways just having you know a little bit of fun and just just being uh just kind of getting to know who who we are and uh we really appreciate you guys having a vision for this because this is a needed part of the church so mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. thanks hey no worries no worries and just before we even go back and start looking a little bit of the story this podcast in particular has been recorded before easter but um, it will be released just after Easter. And in a way, we're just coming up on a year or just past the year of going through COVID and how that's affected the church. And so I'd really love for you guys to yeah. share a bit what it was like to lead through COVID. Uh, I know the theme on Easter this year is come and see. Like, what message would you give to the church on where we're yeah. at now going through COVID? Oh, no, thanks. Um, you know, the first I would say is I think for everybody that I know in ministry, this is, has been a difficult year. Yeah. In 30 years of ministry, uh, the challenges have been really great. Uh, you have media that has been involved with it, politics, a pandemic, all of that wound in together. And, hey, the only thing we want to do is just let the world see who Jesus is. But in the midst of that, it just seems like there's been so many forces on all sides uh, sort of uh, coming in to prevent maybe that message. So it has been challenging, but I tell you what, it's been awesome because mm. it has caused us to pray. Right. It's caused us to seek God. It's caused us to look for venues to be able to present the gospel, uh, even in a, a place where people are quarantining. Now it's the thing of just getting back into the routine of being what God has called the church to be and mm. gathering and discipling. And we just feel like that that's important. We've done it online, and that certainly is a good way to do it. But I don't feel like it's the best way to do it. The best way uh, to do discipleship and ministry is when we're gathered together. So I really feel like, especially with Easter, there's just this marked time that we're going, hey, we need to move forward, get, get on with the business of uh, seeing a world come to know the love right. of God. So that's kind of our heart. And, yeah. you know, but it has been challenging, without a doubt, I'm sure. Could well, and the, some attest. of the avenues that we took, like with drive through church, right. drive in church, um, drive through, drive in church, um, that there were new people that came along because right. in the fall, when we were able to begin to congregate again together, mm. um, and uh, we mm. started up a Bible study with for the women, my classroom was completely almost all new people. Wow. Um, that. I was facilitating to, and some of them had testimonies that they were there because of drive in church. So even in the midst of everything that was happening and the, all of the challenges, mm -hmm. some great things really came out mm -hmm. from that. Yep. Uh, I know. I think that the Lord really did have 
a way of using this to reach out to the community that's been around us. And I certainly remember even in the driving churches, seeing people commit their life to the Lord, waiting for a bus on yep. the side of the road, listening in on some of our driving services. So it's incredible. And Krista, like for me, I was, I was saying to you before we recorded this, that I think when I look back over your guys' years of ministry, you guys have packed in what most people do in a lifetime, I think you guys have done it six or seven times along the way. So <laughs> I'm going to attempt to unpack that a little bit. And maybe you could give us a little bit of the chronological or the just a timeline of ministry from when you met Pastor John to kind of where have you guys been and done ministry up to this point in time? Oh, just to kind of keep it simple, um, we met in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And that uh, he came and interviewed for the position for youth pastor and young adult mm -hmm. pastor. And that's where we met. And we had a, a you know two or three years between our dating and our married time. Um, <laughs> we were there a total of four years. Yeah. Okay. I, it, yeah, yeah. I was on staff there for four. Um, years. And then we moved to outside of Kansas City, Missouri, and mm -hmm. took um, assistant pastor role there. And that one was a little bit shorter <laughs> of a stint of eighteen months. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a roller coaster ride there in Blue Springs, Missouri, <laughs> but all for the good. <laughs> and then we moved to. <laughs> yep. um, Jacksonville, Florida, with mm -hmm. Noah only being six weeks old. Wow. And um, and then Tori was born a few years later. And then not long after that, we were off to Ireland mm. and, uh, and then back eight years. to Jacksonville. It was yeah. eight years. That's <laughs> so weird. Eight years <laughs> there. And then, uh, and then we went on to uh, Ireland for another eight years. The best years. part. Yeah, yeah. And then we've been here for about the nine years. Yeah, the best part. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so question for you guys. So you guys met in Louisville or Louisville. I guess there's like different complications of how you say that. But like who pursued who? And was it love at first sight for you guys? Oh, she completely pursued me. Did she? No, oh, yeah. Is that no, right? I'm, I'm totally joking. <laughs> no, I honestly, uh, when we met, I had a girlfriend and she had a boyfriend. Oh. And uh, I had just taken the position there at the church. And so I remember walking in, she was sitting in a Sunday school class, and I still remember the dress she was wearing, and I remember how she had her hair set up, and I was like, I love Jesus, and I love ministry, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, uh, but we, you know, it was, uh, and really, uh, initially, it wasn't like I was, you know, either one of us, we, we both had uh, people that we uh, already were in relationships with, and both of those kind of fizzled out, and then we started on in a relationship together. So it was it was different because I was her pastor. So I was trying to be very careful to, you know, just, you know, make it more about ministry and seeing her grow spiritually in that. And but after probably, you know, six or eight months, it became pretty evident that there was uh, there was something there. And, mm -hmm. you know, and here we are two <laughs> kids later and 30 years of ministry. So, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, no, I remember that day myself very vividly. And, um, you know, because of our background, um, uh, because we come from uh, broken relationships with our, you know, our parents being divorced several times. Um, it was very important for me mm. because when my parents split, I was about six or seven. Wow. And so I knew even from a young age, even though I maybe didn't uh, remember like surrendering my heart to the Lord, I knew who God was and he was big and mm. and um, you could pray and talk to him. But ever since uh, even a, a young mm. person, it was I had to know that I know mm. that he, this person will be the right person for me because I did not want to walk the shoes that my mom walked. Mm -hmm. And so that was really important. So that day in Sunday school, the young adult Sunday school room, and he came <laughs> in and there was something that just kept speaking to me that he is the one. Wow. And that on was that hard because, yes. On that day. On that day. Wow. She so wasn't going to go into all that, so she obviously then pursued me, right? I guess. Anyway. Well, we had some. So God had to work some. You other guys had to work out some things sure. out there first. There's a lot to work out there. So. That's interesting. You, you kind of mentioned a little bit about there being some brokenness there in terms of the family dynamics you guys came out of. Uh, if you feel comfortable, maybe sharing a little bit about that, and therefore as Christians, ministry. How was that like in the early years of ministry, kind of like working through that and s starting off mm. marriage in a healthy and a ha healthy <laughs> marriage? You know, one thing, and um, yeah. I think both of us really share this. Our parents are, are not bad people, right? Like both her mom and dad and my mm -hmm. mom and dad. But there but in each one of the four cases, um, 
they they were raised in homes that had their own set of difficulties and yeah. challenges and looking back at it now we see they did the best that they could with the tools that they had but there was very little of christ um in really what what happened i'm not saying that we didn't have times that we went to church mm -hmm. but it really become it really was a lot of what that american culture church is where people go to church but you go home and everything is just so upside down and so really at a young age i started to really even I would go to church at times, mm -hmm. but I just doubted so much about God because I, everything I saw at home was so opposite of anything that I saw at church. And then the people that I knew at church had the same kind of lives. And so, um, so you know, one thing that's really important to us, and even in the church here, mm -hmm. is just trying to really help people to grow out of that to really be a reflection of Christ, not just here, but at home. Wow. It has its challenges, you know, but... Yeah, our, but yeah, but our parents had a lot of brokenness, and God has done a lot of healing in all, you know, Absolutely. with all four of them. But it has had its moments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, um, it has. Are, are they Christians today? Have they committed yes. their life to the Lord? And yes. Yeah, yeah. Still struggles yes. along the way, yeah. but definitely nowhere to run to, and that's important. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, some of, and I've shared the testimony here, but you know, my dad um, was at a really broken place at one point when I was in Bible college and, um, and I remember, you know, I, the Lord just told me that I just needed to pray for him. So for about 17 years, I prayed for him nearly every day. Um, and after about 17 years, he gave his life to Christ. He was actually trying to get a date with a girl. And the only <laughs> place that the only place that she would go with him was to a tent revival. And she said, she said, you want to go on a date with me? We're going to revival <laughs> service. And so he was trying to get a date. And so he went on and, and it was right there that God got a hold of him. And uh, he now he teaches Sunday school. Wow. That's amazing. He's walking with God. But it was a, yeah, so it was a, quite a journey there. So That is fantastic. And Pastor John, I think most people who know you at this point in time have heard that you got saved in the Tampa City Jail. Right? <laughs> yes. that, is, that, that is. I think that's a pretty uh, solidified <laughs> fact there. So, yeah. but, but give us a little window into that. And then, and then how did it go from the Tampa City Jail to ministry? Like, wh how, how did that translate? Yeah, you know, I think because, you know, when I, when I was going through high school, I had really started, you know, getting into, you know, partying and drinking and some low-level drugs right after I graduated from high school. It kind of elevated. Um, I went and played college football. There was just a lot of, you know, times I was bouncing bars. Just my life was kind of at that place. And uh, so one night I had taken what was an old manufactured drug. They call them quaaludes. And I had taken one of those, and my blood alcohol was 0.25, so I was driving, and I blacked out. I actually drove about 10 miles. To this day, I still couldn't tell you two, mi two minutes of that drive. Uh, I, I, I'm really lucky to be alive. I drove across interstates from the place that I was at to the place that I went. It was it was a really long distance, and I don't remember any of it. And then I wound up along the way. I got I I hit somebody. Nobody was seriously hurt. Uh, I hurt my knee there, mm -hmm. but nobody was seriously hurt. But um, I was you know just you know they so I spent two days in jail and um, but that was the place I gave my life to Christ. I had a couple of people, and I hope they watch the podcast. I want to kind of put their names out. But uh, yeah. David Satterwhite was a guy that I played football with, uh, and, and I've talked to him since, the influence that he, of him witnessing to me when I was in high school. And I had a coach. Coach Valdez was my homeroom teacher, and uh, that dude was a legitimate Christian. And he was always witnessing to me, and I was always half-step in and half-step out and would never really commit. But when I woke up in jail, I didn't have anybody to – really that preached to me or talked to me mm -hmm. but i just remember the influence of of those people sharing christ and uh i was like god i need some help this is not where i dreamed my life would be and uh so the lord really broke a lot of chains there so very shortly you know thereafter i just started getting into the word i fell in love with god's word mm -hmm. and uh over a period of time i was going to college i was actually doing a business uh, and law degree and uh, just had some, you know, things that I was kind of going through there. And, and then I had a call to ministry. So I left that and then went into, uh, went into ministry and went through Bible college at Southeastern. Mm -hmm. 
And then I met Krista, and here we are. So wow. it's been great. Yeah. No, that, that's amazing. <laughs> and then for you, Krista, did you always see yourself in ministry? Did, was that something from when you gave your life to the Lord? <laughs> Don't laugh to <laughs> <laughs> The question is, did you ever see yourself in ministry? Not, did you always see yourself in ministry? That's a more accurate question. So. Or was that a little bit of a detour or like something that came in? And then probably like a bit of a follow-up question is it, has it lived up to the expectations? Gotcha. Whew. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. If I'm being very candid and honest, I did never, yeah, my, see myself in ministry. Serving God, yes. Um, being a good church attender, yes. <laughs> being involved in things, yes. But I was set to probably because of some of my background too, because of my parents and the hardships that they went through, particularly my mom, I wanted to make sure that I could be independently sound and I could take care of myself. If anything ever, if I did make the wrong decision in marriage, um, that wow. I could, you know, have something to fall back on a uh, very short sighted plan, you know, very, you know, just fleshly plan, nothing spiritual about that at all. So no, I did not at, see myself in ministry. She, by the way, she has a degree in nuclear medicine. Wow. So she, she had her own profession that then eventually she gave up when she kind of figured we were, our marriage was going to make it. Mm -hmm. And uh, then <laughs> she, she gave that up. She focused <laughs> on the kids and, but she does have a degree in nuclear medicine and did that for the first couple years of our marriage. So who's the brains in the operation then? <laughs> <laughs> I'll still. <laughs> I mean, whether I have the brains or not, I, no, I'm joking. she's definitely the smart one. No doubt about it. No, she, that's fantastic. No, I love to hear that, that testimony. And I love to see where God is bringing you guys on the journey. And Pastor John, we, we talk a lot about in ministry, how, there's a concept out there that people like the idea of ministry yep. versus the reality of what ministry is. <laughs> what, what does it mean to be in ministry? What is the reality of ministry? Why do we say that? It's actually, it's actually interesting that you follow yeah. that up from Krista because mm -hmm. when I met Krista, one of my things was in Bible college, there, were so, there was a lot of girls in Bible college that kind of like wanted to be a pastor's wife. But, like, I really did not want to marry somebody just because they want to be a pastor's wife. I wanted mm -hmm. to marry somebody because they love me and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And when I met Krista, not only did, was there just a great connection between us, uh, it, there was so many great qualities of servanthood and loving people and caring about people. And I, what you see here at the church, I, I saw those qualities, and I was like, man, this lady – is a catch. So she never really had this desire to be a pastor's wife, but she has all of the qualities and the characteristics to mm -hmm. do that. And so, uh, so I had talked to her about, Hey, like you understand, this is what ministry is being a pastor's wife. Sometimes people are going to do this or that, and they may attack me and then you're going to try to defend me, but well, we can't really defend ourselves and we have to just put our trust in the Lord. And one of the things I said to her, um, I had actually broke up with a girl that I dated because I, I kind of had said this to her and I, the response I got back wasn't, um, what I was looking for. But one thing that I always said to girls that I started to get serious with, like you understand our life is not our own. So if God calls us to Africa, Asia, or the side of the mountain in Montana, wherever he calls us, we go. And there's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. And, uh, so one, one girl that I was dating was like, no, I can't ever see myself living, you know, leaving mom and dad and our hometown. And I was like, well, well, what if God calls us? Oh, he would never do that. And I was like, okay. Uh, you know, wow. that relationship was, I knew that wasn't <laughs> going to be the place that, but you know, Krista said, said and believed all those things. And she has followed me, you know, obviously as missionaries in different places. But I think that when you ask that question, that sometimes people have an idea of what ministry is. We find that all the time mm -hmm. that people go, Oh, well, people are going to buy my lunch for free all the time. And every, mm -hmm. I'm going to stand up and preach and everybody's going to love me. Mm -hmm. And that's what ministry is. That is the furthest thing from ministry. Mm -hmm, right. Ministry is about laying your life down mm -hmm. the, in the inconveniences and times when you go, hey, I want to do this, but I need to do that. It's the dying to self. It's the living to others. That's the part that when people start to get into it, it, it all looks great until you get to that part. But people who try to do ministry and not have that part, you never really make disciples. It always becomes about yourself and not really about the kingdom or Christ or the people. And so, you know, that's one thing I talk to our staff about all the time. Mm -hmm. Don't fall in love with ministry. Fall in love with Jesus. Wow. 
and he will show you what ministry is. And that's a life of sacrifice, of dying to self and living to others and seeing God glorified in the world that you live in. And I think that that was something that Krista grew into because she, in her mind, she was like, yes, that's what I know is the right answer. But then there were times that we got into places that it was like, okay, God's calling us to go do this. And she was like, hmm. but I just got the job I love. Wow. <laughs> You know the deal. <laughs> oh, but you know, oh, we just built a brand new house. And I'm saying to her, I think God's calling us to be missionaries. And there were times that I think she wrestled with that. But the one thing that we always had in our marriage was this was I would never be at a place that I would make her do something because it was God. I always said to her, Listen, we're in this together. So she always had the ability to say no. Um, and she would pray about it and, you know, it'd take sometimes a little bit of time, but she would come back and she'd be like, no, this is where the Lord has us. And we would always go on those journeys together, but it is that process of mm -hmm. not doing what feels good to us doing what is, you know, kind of the Lord is leading. So, yeah. And I just would like to, mm -hmm. to add into that a little bit too, just relationship wise, yeah. um, for, maybe uh, youth and young adults that are listening to that I definitely um, liked you and then fell in love with who he was. And that was a person of wisdom and he, he knew who he was mm -hmm. and that drew me like crazy. He was, had integrity and it was, there was security there. I knew that he would be a man that didn't waver mm -hmm. and that he would be able to make the tough decisions and that those tough decisions, not that we don't make mistakes and stuff, but they were going to be for the good. They were going to be right decisions. And I knew that I could throw my lot into that. Absolutely. And I felt <laughs> complete peace and complete security in doing that now when you take that and then you put on his occupation at the time and I'm in college pursuing a field um, that I wanted to be working in a hospital that there was the wrestling there was we me and God had a lot of conversations <laughs> and because I would come up with all the reasons why I'm not qualified or I have this in mind God and he's got a way of working out thank God he is long suffering with us because I definitely would probably have dug my heels in or I can still <laughs> when God is up to something but it it came along and and I, I knew what was right and it it was a little more of a progress for me but yeah wow. and, and for clarity's sake yeah, too because just incredible. maybe for maybe some women that are watching they're going oh you know it should be a team that, it, it was it has never been you follow me it has never been hey Krista this is my profession so you follow sure, my profession sure. if if I was um, if I was in the medical field and you were in the medical field we would just make all those decisions together ministry is a little bit different because I don't really I don't even get to call the shots mm -hmm. I go where yeah. the Lord calls me to go wow. so at the end of the day it's not like you know like, you know, well, okay, well, since your job is taking you there, that's where we'll go. No, we both have to surender. Yeah. And literally some of the times that we've made decisions in ministry of going it from one place to another, sense. we're wow. like, but it's comfortable and the pay is less and it doesn't make sense. And even for me, there would be struggles in that. So the, it was never like she's following my ministry. It was always we're following what God is calling us to do. And one time she had a job opportunity in Paducah, Kentucky. My first one, yeah. And so uh, we were in Louisville, and we drive down there, and I'm really trying to be as sensitive as I can. And I'm totally and excited like, because I'm like, I'm going to get a job in I my field. I have a job interview, <laughs> and I am going around there, and I'm like, God, give me a heart for this, and it's uh, nothing again. I know, you know what? Actually, Jesse, our uh, um, uh, our next gen, gen pastor, yeah. is from right by Paducah, Kentucky, and, uh, and so uh, nothing against it. I'm just not... I, it just wasn't me and I wasn't called there. And I just remember going, I am not called to this place. And I just know this isn't the Lord. And at the same time, she's like, Oh, I have an opportunity. It, it was hard. And, um, but, but I do want to make sure that yeah. we're saying that part is it wasn't like she's following me. It was, we were following the Lord. And, and every time that we made those decisions, it would always be together. And at the end of it, 
there might be, you know, things that came along and she might want or I may want, but it was really always a joint thing that we're going, every decision we make. And for young people that are young in ministry, I really want to say that don't ever be that guy that goes, mm -hmm. oh, this is where we're going and follow me. You, you got to do it together. And mm -hmm. sometimes that means being a little patient mm -hmm. and giving your spouse the time to kind of hear from God, maybe what you've heard from God. Um, but the moves that we've made and the places that we've gone has always been, hey, we believe together this is where God is sending us. Mm -hmm. So is that is that accurate? Yeah, for the most part. Now, when, when we have an interview in... For the most part. Yes. Don't make me look bad. No, <laughs> no it is Call it out, Krista. Um, shortly after, you know, being married, um, whenever we came back from our interview outside of Kansas City, Missouri, and... Um, and I remember thinking, because I had my gotten in Louisville mm. where he was already a youth young adult pastor. We were in ministry together. And then I had just the most perfect job because one week I got to be on three days and the next week was two days. And the pay was really good. And it allowed me to have that flexibility for ministry with youth mm. and young, young adults. Mm. Absolutely perfect. So <laughs> whoever was calling from Kansas City had called for months and months and months. And John had first closed the door to it and then he, the gentleman was persistent and so we went out and did that and so here I'm just checking a box like we're just going and we're gonna do this and you know and the whole time when we're there I'm kind of we're answering questions and stuff but I'm going yeah no 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 you know? well, well let me come in on, uh, on yeah. that one for a moment because I'm asking for myself here now so forget all the <laughs> lessons I'm asking for myself here so so me and Sarah obviously are in a place where we have a son and a daughter so it's like kind of same uh, older boy a younger girl and how was it for for you in particular Ms. Chris? because I know for myself I'm I'm a pastor and sometimes we were engaged we're engaged with the ministry aspect of it um as a young adult pastor at, at, in I think it was in Jacksonville you were a young adult pastor and then particularly going on the mission field how was that transitioning dealing with the change how was it just being a mom and kind of balancing some of that stuff along that journey in, in particular. And what, I was asking for myself, but I am asking for everybody else too, because there is moms out there, particularly here in Jacksonville, who are military parents, they're going through changes. They, how, how, how would you ad advise people? Well, flexibility comes to mind completely, mm -hmm. um, as well as, gosh, when, you, when you're clay in his hands and you're surrendered and uh, you are listening to what he's speaking, that helps so much because you have something that you can rely upon. It's a sure foundation there. Mm -hmm. So when he, you have to know that you're called to whatever that next thing is. And right there, just, it just sets the, the foundation there to keep taking steps of faith, of uh, transitioning. It totally was a surrender of here's my family, Lord. Here's me. Here's my family. Here's my life. Wow. We are uprooting and moving, taking the kids away from their friends grandparents which you have two children now and mm -hmm. you know what that is as mm -hmm. well to have them away from grandparents but um staying close to the lord being flexible try not to be overwhelmed with the big picture just mm -hmm. keep taking those small steps of faith wow. along the way yeah, absolutely we, we talk about this from time to time and i think that one of our if you ask what our one of our maybe some of our biggest regrets are mm -hmm. in uh life and ministry one one of them would definitely be um, with our children because I, I was raised in a military home, so we did a lot of moving, and um, and it, it it's hard. It's hard on kids, and we probably at times should have been even more sensitive than maybe what we were, um, but sometimes kids don't know how to articulate what they're feeling, and we would try to yeah. kind of go through, but, you know, um, it's funny because going to Ireland, you would mm -hmm. go, well, it's Ireland. It's beautiful. Ireland is an amazing place to go for two weeks on a vacation. <laughs> but when you talk about living there for eight years and going through itinerary, itineration as missionaries and it's church to church to place to place, uh, raising the funds to be able to help you to go there. And then when you get there, and I don't have to tell you, but Ireland runs a whole different kind of a way. And taking our kids and putting them into public schools. Mm -hmm. um, one, our, Noah, for instance, so when we went in, you know, you, how do you go to an eight-year-old and tell them to be politically correct? Mm -hmm. So one of the first days that they're in school, they, it was when George Bush was president, and 
the teacher started saying something bad about George Bush. Well, Noah is like eight years old and he stands up and goes, you know, George Bush is my president and I'm an American and I love America. The rest of the year he was bullied by the kids because mm -hmm. it was wow. like, you know, and but, but you know what's there. Yeah. So it's facing some of those things and, and man, you're like, your kids don't get it. They're like, Hey, I was comfortable. Why am I going here? Like mom and dad's called right? and trying to right. help them. No, they, they did, they did well in time, but because there was so much change. And even once we went there, we had to come back uh, after three and a half years and do itineration. And then we went back again. Um, yeah. And on top of it, just to say, I think you would agree with this. The hardest transition was after they got uh, settled in Ireland, they really were more Irish than they were American. And then we came back to America when they, in those teenage, those early teenage years. Yeah. And it was like, we don't feel like we, they didn't fit yeah. there. They didn't fit wow. here. It's what's called third culture kids. And then you're trying to parent the kids through that and their hurts and they're not fitting in. And so, um, you know, God did miraculous things as far as the ministry part of it. But I think that 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 aspect of trying to raise kids and make sure that you're caring for their needs emotionally when they're not always even right. able to express what they feel. I think that that's probably been one of our biggest challenges. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we have two, you know, really good kids and um, but it has not been without difficulties. Yeah. You know? I, I think you guys are adopted Irish people at this point in time. <laughs> I think I, I, I seriously mean that. I mean, I know. We're very connected as a church family to Ireland. There's a lot of people who still are very engaged in what's happening here at the Springs Church over there. Um, and I, I, I know because I was the teenager in the right. in the church when you guys came, and I seen you guys work. I, I mean, I say this publicly, and I say this to you guys. I seen the reason I have felt comfortable in following your guys' leadership is because I, I seen in some places where maybe ministry people hid behind the cameras and the spotlights. I seen with you guys that it wasn't just at the big moments. It was at the grassroots level. It was, I remember sitting in the back of the car of the Hyundai <laughs> Trajet or whatever it was, Dragon. traveling to some Hobunk <laughs> country town to do some gospel services. <laughs> Let me ask you guys about that time in Ireland. Like, would you guys feel like, you know, was there a blessing in it? Did the Lord do Absolutely. something there? Like what was, oh, what was, what, what, what did you guys learn there? What was, what came out of that time? Man, I hope some of our Irish friends are watching this, um, but man, Pastor Trevor, Pastor Nick, Pastor Stephen, and the long list goes oh, on. Goodness. Man, people that I would take bullets for, people that I love, uh, that we, we joined our arms together. You know, in Ireland, the, the evangelical church, the people that would be like the born again church would be like less than half of 1%. And so the unity that was there, and nobody cared if you were Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, whatever. Everybody just got on and just loved each other. And, man, those people, are my, they're my brothers and my sisters, and we love them. The, even coming back wasn't something, when we came back to America, it wasn't like, well, we got to get out of here because, you know, it's the, the, it rains all the time and it's cold or, you know, the people are this or that. <laughs> It was, man, we fell in love with Ireland. Did, that yeah. was, uh, I mean. I remember I the day that you guys stood up in the church and it was time to go by. It was an emotional day, like Very. going back. It was, it was kind of like you guys are going to that foreign place, America. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> what are you going doing going over there? <laughs> no, and, and obviously you guys transitioned back here. Let me, let me ask you this um, again for people who are setting out on ministry, young guys who are setting out on ministry. Sometimes it looks like, in ministry that it you're you're very connected you're involved with everybody but sometimes it's hard to be a friend to everybody and sometimes there is like um gaps sometimes there with the interaction what what have you guys done as a family as a couple to stay engaged to stay refueled to stay refreshed what have you guys done to take the pressure off and say hey because you guys have done longevity of ministry yeah. i'm sure at some points you've had to <laughs> kick the shoes off and relax a little bit yeah, and, uh, and I will say, too, the time that we have been uh, back in the States, just uh, here at the Springs Church, I mean, the church has grown, and we've gone through multiple, um, you know, locations, which is always work, 
We now have another location that we're going to. Meanwhile, ministries, and then you have a large staff to keep up with. So there's a lot of things turning the finances and trying to make sure that that is settled because we're a church plant. And so it has, um, it has definitely been a lot of energy. And we try to, you know, on our days off, we try to just chill out. We have a lot of cup of coffees together <laughs> on the back porch and chat and talk. And uh, every, you know, once in a while we try to get away and, um, you know, just really spend time refueling i'm i'm probably i i know this generation is more you know set on conferences and things like that probably most of our ref i know for me it's just getting into the word and and taking some time in prayer and just letting the lord just you know kind of refuel that life because and sometimes it just it doesn't take a long time but just taking those moments where you're just like lord just refresh me and help mm -hmm. me and uh, it's man ministry. If you're not connected to the vine, uh, <laughs> the branch will break. Right. Wow. And it's really important to stay connected to that vine. Um, so I, you may. No, absolutely. There's a lot of hats that get worn. And um, sometimes those moments to try to catch your breath are few and far between. Mm -hmm. And so um, we don't try to concentrate too much on quantity. It's more of quality. So when we do sit down it's good and i'm thankful for that because the foundation from the beginning is secure and so when it you know when there's not so many of those slow down moments for us and we need to do some catch up still there's just there's this sense of security there's this sense of peace um w i still got your back you got my back mm -hmm. and even though we might not have had too many sentences in the last few days together we can just look at each other and we can just know and um Oh, hey, it, we're we're moving forward, and I know, I know where we're going. And this, you know, it's helpful to know that this place is but a vapor. This is not eternal. Hmm. Where we are headed, and what we are doing for for the Lord, and how He's using us and the church body for for His purposes. That's what at the end Amen. of the day matters. So that is that fuel that keeps me going because outside of that no I'm, I'm hanging up my shoes and my hat and going ah, i'm out <laughs> i gotta be honest with you too if you go back to those times and go hey i went to bible college and you know you meet these girls and they want to be a pastor's wife when i met krista and you see the genuineness and there's just a lot of great qualities and i want to tell you i married the right girl and uh, she serves the people she loves god she serves me she helps me and we're and i we're not drawing any pictures here that like we're perfect people oh, goodness, and perfect no. situations. We certainly um, have made mistakes, and uh, there's times that, you know, we, we, we've had moments of brokenness and hardship, but, you know, we have found God has been faithful every step of the way, and the places that we've gone in ministry has just nearly been supernatural. Every place that we've been, whether it's growth or just, just, just the things that have happened spiritually, numerically, just God has done some really good things. And uh, along the way, we are the most blessed people. And I'm glad you're on the journey with me. Thank you. <laughs> you know, so. another as well, like our kids have seen us in the good times, the medium times, and in some broken places as well. Yeah. And um, we've never really hidden that from them. I don't know whether that was good or bad or what. It's just the way that it was. But they were able to see the faithfulness of God and how he worked in our hearts and in our lives mm -hmm. to not stay in those places if they were low spots for us. Sure. So I, I just want to say, too, that just for you guys and for Noah and for Tori as well, for you guys as a whole family unit, I think I speak for a lot of people that when we look at you guys, we see the faithfulness of God upon your lives. Mm -hmm. We see the testimony, the protection, the hand, the mountains, the valleys, but God's consistency in the mm -hmm. whole thing. And you touched on, Pastor John, how like a lot of things that you guys have put your hand to, the ministry has grown. God has blessed it. Things have happened. I mean, like right now at the Springs Church, God is doing miraculous things. I just, Pastor Matt Poole and Robert Reach Pastor has talked about how a guy showed up at the door the other day looking for some finances from bread for just he was in a low place. And now he's in a rehabilitation center, has committed his life Praise to Christ. God. That is the continuous process that we see what's happening in the church. And we hear people come in all the time and say, wow, this is a miracle. I think we're seven, eight years here at, 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 with the Springs Church. How is this even possible? How can a church go from zero to this in that short space of time? 
how? What's the, what's the secret? What's, what do you say to the pastor out there that's church planting? And it's like, how did Pastor John and Krista do that? Well, and I, and I say this yeah. a lot, and I want to make sure that people understand this. When I say, hey, it's my job to get out of the way, we understand that we have to take steps of faith. So I'm not when I'm saying that right. people mm-hmm. will come back and say, oh, you, you don't, you know. But no, it's really getting my flesh and my yeah. desires and what I want to out of the way and just plainly going, God, whatever you want. And, I, you know, just to kind of tie a few things together, because I know you're talking a little bit about our trail and ministry. Yeah. But when we were young adult and youth pastors here in Jacksonville, the average attendance at our youth was about was like 386 for the, you know, the last year there and a couple hundred young adults. So it was this really flourishing ministry. We had outreaches and prison ministry. And when I went to Ireland, the first year that I went there that we were called to go there, there was 25 people. You remember Donnie Brook oh, Hill yes, and so. the little, you know, place. And I'm standing at the altar and the Lord saying, I'm going to make this a light to the city and the nation and to all of Europe. And I was like, this little hole in the wall, <laughs> like it just didn't make any sense Absolutely. to leave where I was at to go to that. And, you know, but we followed the Lord there. And so your I'm, youth and young adult group was, I can't even do the math, but it was a, a lot, lot of times yeah, yeah. bigger than <laughs> the church in Ireland at the time that you were going. Oh, to. yeah. Multiple yeah. times wow. bigger than the than the church. there. But when we when, then when we went there and, uh, you know, you're here as the witness. Yeah. By the time we left there. What a great church is the light to the city there in uh, Court Church and all across Ireland, the largest conference. We went all up and down the country, uh, planning churches, helping churches. And then I had a ministry that went all across Europe and right. Pastor Nick as well. And we're doing conferences and stuff. So everything that God promised at that church of 25 people, he made happen. Wow. But I didn't know that when I'm standing at, you know, this, you know, I'm standing at this altar in a church that said about 25 or 30 people. And I'm going, why would I come here to do this? Mm. Well, then when we get to that place and we're going, hey, we're loving Ireland. Ministry is hopping. Everything's going. <laughs> the dream came true. And then Krista's dad is in the is in the motorcycle accident. Wow. And here's a good example of me following her in ministry. Because then it's my dad has the head injury. Wow. And I'm going, I'm not leaving here. Like, I had it made. I was perfect situation. Wow. Like, yeah, I love yeah. ministry. I, w- I was ready to plot, put my plot in <laughs> Ireland. I could live and die with old, what was it, St. Patrick. I could have, you know, I just, I love the people. I yeah. love the ministry and everything that was there. And then her dad winds up with a head injury. So, you know, we're, and, and I wrestled with that because I was like, now I got to go do <laughs> follow you now. But it, but again, it's not following her. It was following the Lord. And it was a good, I would say, three or four months. I'm really, you know, wow. it really wasn't an option. We had to come back. But I was going, God, I've never have I made a, an adjustment in ministry like that when God is doing so many good things. Pastor Nick was wrestling with it. And I'm like, but I knew that we had to do that to look after a family member. There was nobody else that was going to look after him. And so um, so I knew it, but I was like, I need to hear something from the Lord. I was mowing grass in Ireland, which the grass grows high in Ireland. Beautiful. And I'm mowing the grass. <laughs> Best grass day. in the world. And, <laughs> and the Lord. And I would the, agree. The most beautiful grass no red in the ants. world. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm out mowing the lawn, and, um, and the Lord spoke to me. And this is the only thing that he said to me is I've called you to be a righteous testimony. Hmm. And I came back and I said, <laughs> we're supposed to be in America. And she goes, how do you know? The Lord said, we're supposed to go and be a righteous testimony. And she goes, well, what does that mean? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> does that mean pastor church? I don't know. Does that mean wow. being an evangelist? I don't know. To go and be a righteous testimony. I'm literally, we're flying on the airplane, no insurance, no job. We're coming back and, and we're going. So what does that mean? I don't know. But we're going to go and whatever God tells us to do, that's what we're going to do. And if that's in Colorado, if that's in New York or that's in Jacksonville, whatever he wants. So just to, you know. So no idea, no idea where you guys were going when you got on the plane and came back to the States. I had, uh, and you know this too, I had an interview in Colorado Springs with um, Pastor Gary Wilkerson, which is one of our overseers, love him. And then I also met with Pastor Carter. So there were definitely options that were there in job opportunities, but as far as having anything concrete or knowing what we were supposed to do, I mean, we're obviously mm-hmm. called to ministry, so I knew I was supposed to do something, but exactly what that looked like, we just didn't know. And ultimately, when we met with Pastor Gary and Pastor Carter, 
the Springs Church and, you know, starting the church is what came out of that. Mm-hmm. But the point I'm making is I'm in Ireland. We mm-hmm. are loving what we're doing. God is doing phenomenal things. You, you know, right. planning churches. God is just, I mean, just supernaturally moving in so many ways. Absolutely. And then we're like, now we're going back like, hey. That's that's not easy. And then we start with, you know, a handful of people in a trailer (laughs) and you're like, but I had this great ministry in Ireland. Like, why am I sitting in this room with like, you know, eight people in a in a trailer and starting a church? And I'm like, but I was doing such a good thing on the mission field. And now here I am, you know, kind of no offense, but it just, you know, it just didn't make sense. Absolutely. Well, now it makes sense that we're eight and a half years down the road. And now we see everything that God has done. But, um, but if I were saying to people that are young in ministry or whatever, man, just get your idea or thoughts or what benefits you or your pay package Get all of that out of the way and just go, Lord, what do you want? What do you want? Yeah. And when you follow that, not only will you find a good life, but the blessings of God, he'll care for you. He'll look after you. Uh, it's when you try to manipulate, when you try to maneuver, when you try to make things happen out of the hand of flesh, our experience has been you always wind up in broken, dry places. But when you, when you put him first and you follow his way, his path, he tends to do some pretty amazing things. So. Always, always. And then so, wow, that's incredible. I mean, yeah. it's extraordinary, really, that you were in that place. So you're coming back on the plane, and you don't know if you're going to end up in Colorado, New York City, and then it's Jacksonville. Here, uh, I think on the west side, it was on a trailer. And so, and yeah. tell us like a little bit of the journey of the Springs Church from the trailer. Where did you guys go next? What happened? Kind of a little bit along there. To the house. <laughs> to the house. Yeah, and to again, a little yeah. little shout out. We were at a church, West Side Family Worship Center on 103rd. When we came back, mm-hmm. the pastor there was getting a master's degree, and he asked if we could come and help him with some preaching and, and some stuff while we were there. And it was the trailer there in the church that we first started meeting. And then, uh, and then we had a house because we had lived here before. And once we didn't want to have our renters move out because we didn't know where we were going to land. Once we knew that we knew that we were going to be starting a church, then we went through the process of them mm-hmm. leaving, and then we moved back to it. So then when, when, then when we moved uh, back into our house, then we started the meetings at our house, which was bigger than the trailer. I think the time we were at about 50 or 60 people, then at that point uh, we, we started to look for a storefront. Um, so uh, right off of Collins Road. Right. So we were at a storefront. Then we went to the movie theater. So, you know, it, there was a few different places there. Few different places. And like, of course, on that journey, there was different places, but there was seemed like there was no point of reference on how to lead in those places. Mm-hmm. Like you show up in Jacksonville as a youth, young adult pastor. You show up in Ireland. You don't you've never been in Ireland before. Uh, you've never been missionaries before. Then you come to Jacksonville to church plant. You've never church planted before. And then you're going through this year of COVID. There's no point of reference to kind of go, oh, we've done this before. What, what, what do we do as pastors? Where do we lead from? What's the strategy? What's the, the vision that we do when there's no point of reference? I think, too, you have to look, what is the needs mm-hmm. that are out there? Wow. Amen. Yeah, well, you know our Jesus strategy. So our strategy is pray, and Jesus will tell you what to do. Because, like in Ireland is a good frame of reference. We may there may have been half a dozen churches in the whole Republic of, of Ireland that would own a property. Everything was rentals. Everything was leases. It was being in a gym. It was being in a, you know, a, like a neighborhood hall or something like that. But, ve- you know, which makes ministry difficult. Um, but here's what we've learned is this. The church is not a building. It's yeah. not a facility. It is the people. Now, that doesn't mean don't go to church. What that means is that we connect. We do ministry But whether we have this facility, that facility is irrelevant. What matters is the connection and the growth with people. And so the one thing that has never changed, whether it's Ireland, whether it's youth pastoring, whether it's it's, uh, church church planning here is, uh, you know, at the Springs Church is we just connect and grow and disciple and help people to see Jesus you know, I got one job is to help people to see how great and wonderful Jesus is. And if they can see how great he is, man, God takes care of all the other issues. 
And I really, I'd like to say that I had some strategic plan for being at the place that we're at. I find most of the time when I make plans, they never work out the right way. So I just go, God, you open the door and give me the faith when you open the door to walk through the doors that you open and don't let me be small in the way that I believe. Yeah. And I go, it's too, when we came into this building, you remember, oh, yeah. we came into this building, we were like, we are going to be engulfed. This building is mm. 40,000 square feet. It's so huge. And we had a little over 200 people and we're like, this, we're going to get lost in here. And now we have multiple services oh, yeah. and we use every inch and every part of the church. Mm -hmm. But but it was the thing of God, you make this opportunity available. Give us the faith to walk through the doors that you open mm -hmm. and don't let me think small. Help me to, to think kingdom thinking. And God, if it seems impossible, that's probably just exactly what you're doing. And help me to find what looks impossible to mm -hmm. me. Because what's impossible to me is just where you begin to start doing some something that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And so that's our, amazing, you know, yeah. just. It is. Ireland was good ground for that because, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, um, Owen, that, you know, we were down in a what was an old pet shop and above where we oh, had yeah. Sunday school classes for the children yeah. were apartment rooms. And we had Sunday school for kids like in the kitchen and a living room area. And Absolutely. packed in like sardines, and it's not your ideal situation, but it was amazing. It was wow. exciting. <laughs> Do you feel it helped you guys? Oh, I, that's interesting. for me it did. I've never really seen that before, but like when you're talking about small little spaces and ministry thriving, like in the States you think of big facilities and stuff, but when you started, you guys had to work with similar situations. It was almost like a setup in a lot of ways, wasn't it? Absolutely. Wow, that's Absolutely. so interesting. I remember walking into this building and I was like, I was looking at this green behind us and the lights, thinking our our floors in this facility were had green, the exact same color, and we yep. we've we've come a long way <laughs> away from that moment in time. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, Krista, just to I've only a few more questions for you guys, and then I'm going to start wrapping this up. But I want to ask you just in this time of being back in the state, what, and, and and you can go back further. What was it like for you fulfilling, like, you know, you were a caregiver to your dad coming yeah. back, two teenagers growing into young adults. How did you find fulfilling your calling, your place in ministry as a pastor's wife? And if I could ask a follow-up question to that, too, is do you feel like the role as a pastor's wife has kind of evolved or changed since you, since you guys started to the place that it is right now? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. <laughs> Can I just say this? When we started, it was like, I look after the kids, you do the ministry. Like for uh, our first couple of years, it was like, you go do the ministry, I'll watch the kids. Right. And it was like, okay, that was kind of our yeah. reality. And now she's, you know, it, that's changed incredibly. Yeah. But. No, and, e and even a little bit before that, I mean, like I, w I shared that, um, you know, I'm, I'm pursuing still a career. I'm going mm -hmm. down this road. And mm -hmm. then whatever time outside of that career, I'll, I'll come in right next to you, honey, and be your support and um, be – uh, in front of people, having to speak, having to do any of that outside of just loving on people. Uh, that's, that's where I was, you know, like I'll, I'll help you and I'll help you shine, <laughs> but let me be back behind the scenes. Um, and let me do the, the background work. So, um, the Lord has been so, so, so kind mm -hmm. as he has helped me to be that soft clay, um, in his hands because he has definitely in Ireland, there was, I know I'm kind of jumping a little bit, there's, you know, years in between that, but in Ireland, there was definitely a shaping happening there where I really had to die to what I was hanging on to. Wow. And, and are you going to come into what I'm calling you into? Because I have more for you. I have different plans than what you had, Krista. And it was... It was we, a we had just nine built a, months there. <laughs> we had just built a new house here. I think you've been in the house. It's a be it's a smaller house, but beautiful, beautiful home. Uh, we love it there. And um, uh, uh, but anyway, we we rent it out now. But uh, it was we had just built it. It was so nice. So when we go to Ireland, our first month we're living in the blue house. Oh, <laughs> there's goodness. literally there's mold growing, <laughs> and it, we're sleeping, and we're waking up in the morning, and there's mold oh, like gosh. all over the walls. <laughs> and God bless, it was a great place to stay. You know, it was nice and all, but it was, it just it was. And then we go to the grocery store, and you know, again we we came to the place that we adjusted. But I remember the first three or four times we'd go to the grocery store, 
Krista would just stop in the aisleways and start crying. And she was like, <laughs> nothing here is like makes sense. And it just, you know, the stuff. Why that do I, people eat beans with their breakfast? All that kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was, but everything was just, you know, things were just much different than what we had. And I think that in a lot of ways, I think that, yes, we went and God did some miraculous things there. And we love our time in ministry. But what God did in us was really moved us, moved us out of our comfort zone yeah. and what feels familiar. And for Krista, it was really, there was a huge growth yeah. that happened in her life. Wow. She really learned what it was to trust God, not just ministry wise, yeah, but just personally to wake up in the morning and go, hey, I'm satisfied with where you have brought me and where I'm at and what we're doing. And I, I think that that was a challenge. Um, it definitely was to get to that place because you talked about it evolving. And, and then when you get to that place where you just kind of mm. a little bit out of just, you know, what else can I do but just go here, God, because right. I'm, I'm tired of fighting you, Lord, on what I think I need to do and what you want from me, too, and what you have for me, um, that that's where God began to really take me. And then some the fruit just began to come out of me because it wasn't me anymore. And it was letting mm -hmm. him just have his way. And then coming back, you know, along that journey line was just constant surrender, constant surrender of I'm just clay in your hands or whatever you ask me. I want to be that woman. I want to be that daughter of the king that just is obedient. And um, and that was a struggle for me because yeah. I had my own agenda, my own plans. I want to tell you, she's a, she's an amazing lady. I think probably the most underrated, you know, definitely most underrated part of our ministry because I'm the one that's more out in front. But man, she is she's more of a rock than. Thanks what she thinks she is but i think so. that hits on an area as well we you know we do a lot of small groups here a lot of connect groups and that's important to have community mm -hmm. around you because i could of course i lean on my my husband and the kids uh, were helpful as well in that mm -hmm. regard but then i have friends mm -hmm. godly women sisters in the lord that come alongside and and they help lift my arms up and they'll speak truth and in, into my situation and remind me that's another thing is we have to remind ourselves of god's promises and 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 also just to put our gaze upon him about who he is his attributes when we do that everything else begins to diminish and just grow you know dim in the light of who he is and um yeah it's just like kind of this the, the yeah. what's that called a sketch etch a sketch where you kind of shake it and it starts all over that's the lord like here let me just take your day and we're going to start over here wow. when it's tough, you know? Well, it's interesting because out of that too, we have the women's ministry in the church that has literally thrived to the point that I was like, Krista, could you stop doing so well at the women's ministry because you're making all of <laughs> all, all the other ministries here. I have to catch up. Now. Well, I'm, Sean it, Vick it, is it, doing it, it now and, and Sean Vick is doing amazing. Is. And Lynette does amazing. There's a, great a really team. great team, the ladies there. And I love that. I came out of the friendships and connection yeah. and stuff that was there. Just honing in now, just kind of, come towards the end of this conversation is like what I know you talked about the family dynamics being difficult in ministry throughout the years but aside from that what has been the hardest thing about being in ministry what's the hardest thing that you guys have felt in the all of the different places that you guys have been in what has been the hardest thing to work through and how do you come through that if that's possible I don't know if that's even possible but oh, in a nutshell well I can put my I, I think it's the hardest thing probably as a Christian is when you feel like you've loved people and you've done the right things and then you either feel like maybe they haven't treated you well or you're, or they're not listening or kind of feeling for the situation that you're in. I mean, I, we've been honest with that about, you know, COVID in the last year and you, you know, you try to make the best decisions and you have people that like, you know, we try to live in a way that we show gra grace to people, even we may not necessarily agree. And it's hard when you're going like people that you love and care about and they get so like, wear the mask, don't wear the mask, wash your hands, don't wash your hands. It's like some of that. And you're like, dude, we're just trying to love people. We're just trying to get right. people to be close to Jesus. And there have been times in ministry when you try to love people, you try to do the right things, you try to minister to people. And then and then sometimes, man, you, you know, I do not know 
how Jesus, because yeah. when you have the multitudes that left, I, I preached on this a few weeks ago, uh, and it says that he, he knew that Judas was the one that was going to betray him. And it was a good year before he actually betrayed him. Mm. How in the world Jesus walked with Judas for a year and the whole time loved him to the place that when he said, one of you will betray me. And the 12 disciples were like, who? One of us? Like, who? like instead of them going, oh, obviously it's Judas because you could tell the friction. But there was none of that. He wow. loved them all yeah. regardless of how they treated him. And that's the part. And I'm not, hey, I'm not whining or cry. like we understand that's what ministry becomes is that sometimes you pour your life out to people. You love people. And then and then what you get in return isn't always what you've given out. But that's what you have to surrender to, to the Lord. That's what ministry is. And very early in ministry, I, I can I, I actually remember the time and the place that I was at because every pastor that I knew at that point was very uh, put up a good face and make yourself look perfect and don't let people in your world and keep a distance from people. And that's sort of that traditional way of ministry. And I remember the Lord saying, if you let people in your life, they'll hurt you, but it's the only way you can really disciple yeah. them. Mm -hmm. And you have to pull the walls down and be honest, engage with people, regardless of what they may say or do. To me, the crux of ministry is when you can pull those things down and make yourself vulnerable to the place that you may be hurt. But in, in, in spite of it, you know, that's the only way that you can really get to the places to share the love of Christ to people who really will love and receive and grow from it. And so, um, I, I mean, if I, if I take 30 years of ministry, I could put it in that little cup and that would be about, uh, probably the most difficult part. Mm -hmm. And I could, I could trail every place that I've been. There's been places where your heart nearly gets broken, but then you have to go, it's not about what I feel, it's not about me, it's about Jesus and the kingdom. And when you walk through that in a way that you're then glorifying God and keeping your eyes on Jesus, God just tends to bring people, grow people, and do and do those kind of works in people. But I, I, could, I could point to every place, won't do it, but um, I could point to every place is where, you know, just the disappointment Mm -hmm. of where people kind of respond in ways that you're like, man, I'm just trying to love. I'm just trying to do what's right. I'm just trying to do the right things. And then you, when you get kicked back in return, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> we can write, we can write a book about it. You can write it. a book about you're it. You're going, man, what, yeah. what's that? Where'd that come from? Mm -hmm. And we know where it comes. It comes from the enemy. It's because he always wants to discourage you. But when you can walk through that discouragement and go, no, it's not about me. It's about Jesus and his kingdom. That's when he that's when you step into the threshold of seeing God do things that go uh, above and beyond and the amazing things. So incredible. Absolutely. So. And, you know, like just thinking about that, I coming here from Ireland to Jacksonville, I was kind of wondering, you know, God, why did you bring me to this place? <laughs> and like, it was just an interesting, like, why did you bring me here to Jacksonville <laughs> myself? We are the next podcast. I'm not being interviewed. I'm not being interviewed. You and Sarah are going to be the next yeah, podcast. Okay, right, 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 right. <laughs> we went through the Publix and we were crying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I was, uh, you know, when we, when we started to meet the people, we found that there was a lot of people here that had been hurt in church. You know, we had mm -hmm. people coming from every background, every denomination sure. coming yeah. into our church. Like there was, people, and there was just a lot of hurt that people that were carrying through church. Yeah. You know, if this is kind of something you guys have felt along the way, is there anything that you could say to the church as a whole? What could we do better to work with each other, to work through seasons? What What, what are something that we could do to, because we, we, we've experienced that and we see that. Well, one of the things that we do to counteract it here is that we have a we have a very transparent policy. So we just go, if you have a problem or an issue, just come and sit in the office yeah. and sit down and talk through it. And I may not always agree and I may not always do everything. There's no way you can do everything that everybody wants, but at least to listen to people and to hear whatever the issues may be and try to work through them and try to bring healing. And it's listen, and it's not just an American thing. I could, you know, I hope Pastor Nick is watching, but Pastor Nick could sit here and talk about the hurt that he's been through in ministry in Ireland. And, you know, it, that's an, it's wherever you go in the world. Right. And I think it's the enemy who is always wanting to bring division. Right. And I think that when you can talk and you can listen and you can walk through things and try to put yourself in the other person's position, 
that, you know, a lot of times you can help to understand where they are and who they are. And I think in the church, sometimes we can be so dogmatic about the Bible or, you know, doctrine or whatever. And I am like, listen, mm -hmm. I love Bible and I love doctrine, but I, I also have to be careful that I don't love my doctrine mm -hmm. uh, so much that I, that I don't love people in the midst of right. it. And sometimes you just have to listen to people. And so sometimes good. you just have to walk through things and then you have to be able to go, I'm sorry. Yeah. And sometimes we have to be able yeah. to go, you know what? I, I didn't mean to say or do that, but I'm sorry if I Absolutely. said that and offended you. And but the church has got to do that. Otherwise, the very thing that I hated that I was raised in was this superficial church. I don't want to be that. And so I think good. the one thing that people say when they come here is it's a healthy church. But one of the reasons I think that we have a healthy church is because we don't want to be superficial, that authentic people trust in Christ is the reality of where we want to live. And that means that you sit and you listen and you talk and you work through things and you're committed to one another. And when you do that, then church families are healthy and you walk together. And the result of it is rather than a church being ingrown and it's just about us, it's yeah. a church that reaches the city because now we're in unity where there's a real genuine love that's there. And I'm convinced that that's when people talk about going to a church, they want to be a part of a church that has that kind of genuine love and wow. authenticity. Right? Yeah, a couple of words that are coming to my mind is just relational and approachable. Mm. And that's real important. And I can honestly say that comes from the top down. Because, I mean, and I'm more introverted, so there's times when, you know, you, you've done all the services for the day and I kind of want to corral them and be like, can we go get our lunch and just kind of, you know, uh, have a little bit of solitude and some peace. And, I'm at the front door yeah. shaking hands and she's like. Yeah, yeah. And he is. He's out there yeah. and, and wants to be out there and it's not a, a put on face. It's who he is. And, for sure. and I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. And. I mean, how do we love on, you know, those that are outside the four walls if we don't even the ones that are wow. within here, our core people and our faithful people that we're not staying right there being relational and approachable and, you know, instead of running yeah. out to lunch. <laughs> like sometimes so I good. Do. <laughs> Honestly, thank you, guys. That is so good. And on the flip side of that, as a side note, have you any idea how many people have come through your guys' ministry that's now in some sort of ministry today or in full-time ministry at one point i was keeping track of that it, um like 75 or 80 mm -hmm. but and i want to say this That's as incredible. well but one of the reasons yeah. and it was i i think it was really in those early times in ministry because a lot of the people that i was around and ministry sometimes can be this way you know kind of get up and talk in front of people say your thing and then keep these kind of walls around yourself so people can't get too close and can't see you can't see the warts you know what we by letting that that down it seems like oh you make yourself vulnerable and you do yeah but you also make yourself real yeah and when people wow. young guys can walk through ministry and you can be honest with them and kind of go through the hurts and the pains and really talk about the issues and talk about what what character really is and really start to engage with them in that kind of a way it really helps them to grow that's where spiritual growth is at and i just think that so much of our nation in America particularly, we have become we we have become so religious and we don't even know it. Hmm. And um and, and it's it's like, hey, fall in love with Jesus and let it be real and let it be honest and sincere. And when you do that, it really makes a reflection in the lives of people that are around you. So yes, yeah, so there is a lot of uh, you know, young men and women that are in full-time ministry. We have some of them that are here on staff that mm -hmm. have come through our ministry mm -hmm. and even done Bible college classes with them. And mm -hmm. I've done a few Bible colleges <laughs> over the years. And um, so we have been very uh, blessed. Wow. Very blessed. This is my final question and a final word for you guys as well <laughs> coming up right here. We're getting through it. We're nearly <laughs> done. You guys have done. It's fantastic. And honestly, so much wisdom that has come forth from today. My kind of last question, and then you guys can say whatever you want on the back end of this question, is what's the, what's the future for, for Pastor John and for, for Krista and for your guys' family? What, what, what's next? What, what keeps you guys going? What's the goals? What's the future? What's the vision for, for you and your family? Yeah. I'm the detail lady. You're the big picture. So. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, you, start. It, you know, it's been amazing. And, um, you know, um, I think that the Lord has done a real resurgence in my life because the church has obviously grown numerically 
and it's really going god help us uh, as a staff and as people to really make people count i think it's too easy when the church starts to get a little bit larger there's like move them in move them out and we really want to I can't do all that myself. I'm mm-hmm. incapable to make every hospital call, do every small group, every home fellowship group, I shake every hand. I can't I can't do that and nor should I. Mm-hmm. But when the church becomes like that, yeah. I think this the the potential to reach a community becomes greater. So, um I I've, I've really, you know, I think you know 70 some countries that we've done ministry in. When you when I think of like anything to put on a resume to like I went here and I did this and I, all of that is really I, I don't live for any of that. It just hey Lord, just let me hear your voice and help me to plan in the lives of the people around me, my son and my daughter yeah. and my wife and the staff that we have and people that are in our church family. And um I, I just wanna see the Lord glorified and mm-hmm. I'm older now, definitely got the gray hairs. Um, but I know that our heart is we just want to see people go in depth and we want to see the church continue to reach the community. We're excited. I mean, buildings and things like that. Mm-hmm. But honestly, facilities are um, I never really get like this, like so excited about facilities. We're excited about what the facilities can bring and what wow. they can do. But I do think that the facility that we're going to be going into is going to be a place that is going to help us to continue to minister to people and reach people. And, uh, you know, we just want to continue to see young yeah. men raise up. I, I look at you. I look at Jesse. So many of uh, Pastor Matt. Yeah. Man, there's there's young men that God is just bringing up all throughout the church. And um, and, and we want to invest and see them continue to grow and you guys will far out do anything that we've ever done in and ministry. That, and that <laughs> should be the goal, yeah. you know. And Je- isn't that what Jesus yeah. said is you mm-hmm. will do far greater things mm-hmm. once I I go away. And that's the same thing, too, is as we get older in years and, you know, further along, it's the next set that's rising up and we get to, you know, whatever we have in these moments and even in the years to come, we want to pour that back mm-hmm. into. But we also know we are going to be surrounding ourselves with with young men and women that are going to do greater things. And and the wonderful thing is we get to bask in that as they as they rise and as God glorifies himself in them. And Amen. it's beautiful and we love it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, listen, uh, incredible testimony. I really wanted to do this today. I really wanted to get you guys, get you away from just having to, to preach it and getting you guys <laughs> away from, and just have a conversation yeah, yeah. and put it on record because there's been a lot, a lot of ministry, a lot of experience, a lot of victories and a lot of battles that you guys have obviously walked through today. And and uh, I just want to say for me, and I think for so many other people that are out there, thank you guys. Thanks for fighting the good fight. Thanks for thanks for sticking through it. Thanks for, for Ireland. Thanks for, you know, when all of the challenges and changes and shifts and you had to deal with the, the aisle of all the food items that was there in, in Ireland to deal and with. And I grew to love every single yeah. one of them. I'm sure you did. <laughs> not every single one of them. Most of them. Oh, but my not goodness. <laughs> but Bassett we, scones and yeah. Caroline, come no on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we want to say thank you guys so much. And um, we believe the best days are yet to come. And so so thank you guys. And that's really it for the podcast for today. It's being Beyond Sunday. I hope you guys will share it out with your friends and review it. And um, I thank you guys so much. Well, one last thing I got to say this to yeah. you, Owen. Good job. Well done, Owen. Uh, <laughs> Oprah, better look out. Because <laughs> we got this. <laughs> I got the puffy hair to go with it, too. Because <laughs> here comes Owen. <laughs> thank you guys so much. <laughs> hey, thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Beyond Sunday podcast. We hope and pray you were truly blessed and encouraged by Pastor John and Krista's story. Be sure to share this out with friends and family. Let them know how the Beyond Sunday podcast is encouraging you and ministering to your life.